White Panther program is cultural revolution by any means necessary. Uh, we've drawn up a 10-point program. The first point is uh, full endorsement and support for the Black Panther Party's 10-point program. Uh, point two is uh, total assault on the culture by any means necessary, including rock and roll dope and fucking in the streets. We did not make the laws in this country. We are neither mor morally nor legally confined to those laws. Those laws that keep them up keep us down. You got to begin to understand that. John Sinclair well, you, you was put away for 10 years for possessing two marijuana joints. He, he spent two years of it in prison, virtually in isolation, in solitary. John Sinclair is best known as the 60s marijuana activist who was sentenced to 10 years in prison for giving two joints to an undercover policewoman. He was eventually freed when John Lennon and Yoko Ono spoke out on his behalf. What is less understood is his role as the founder and chairman of the radical anti-war group, the White Panther Party, an offshoot of the Black Panthers. The Black Panther Party was a militant political organization formed after the murders of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Robert Kennedy. This nation is in a state of turmoil perhaps unparalleled in our history. Poverty amidst wealth, widespread racism, and bewilderment over a strange war are the seeds of the revolution. Black Panther Party must develop still a power base. Whenever the people disagree with the political decisions that have been made upon their heads, that whenever the people disagree with those political decisions, the racist power structure sends their guns and force to see that the people accept those political decisions. But we are here as revolutionaries to let them know that we refuse to accept those political decisions of our black people and other people in the world. These racist Gestapo pigs have to stop brutalizing our community or we're going to take up guns, we're going to drive them out. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. During the Cold War, the U.S. government launched a secret program called COINTELPRO to disrupt and ultimately destroy the Black Panthers and the anti-war movement. As part of this program, John Sinclair was set up and imprisoned on marijuana charges. When the government could no longer justify denying him a bond over two joints, they falsely charged him with a federal conspiracy to blow up a CIA station in order to make him disappear. In this case, we find the secret origins of so much that troubles us today, like classifying dissidents as terrorists, or the use of warrantless wiretaps and indefinite detention. The things that were revealed during John Sinclair's case are what the U.S. government would prefer history forget.
I was charged with being a member of a conspiracy to blow up the CIA recruiting office off the Michigan Can University of Michigan campus in Ann Arbor with two other guys who won't to this day have met whether they did it or not, but I wasn't really part of this. I was a case of mistaken identity. Because <laughs> there was a guy who was at a meeting who was the brother of one of the other defendants, but he looked like me and we both had long brown hair and beards. And so they used that to place me in the conspiracy. Well, basically the ploy to put me in this was to keep me from ever getting a bond because now I was a violent person who blew up shit. Well, before that, I'd just been an advocate of blowing up shit. <laughs> so we advanced under the free speech laws, you know. <laughs> but these guys actually blew this shit up. It was a beautiful, it was in a, what we called in those days an act of armed propaganda. The CIA was forbidden by law from being active within the continental United States, within the statutory United States. They weren't supposed to operate inside, inside the country at all. Well, we found that, of course, on college campuses, they had active recruiting efforts and offices, and they tried to get the best and the brightest of the young people to join the CIA, really combat communism and advance the causes of liberty and freedom, which the CIA was charged with protecting and advancing. <laughs> so we thought this was really quite a severe contradiction that they were there on the campus where they weren't even supposed to be doing this. And in those days, even till the end of the 60s, the CIA was a very clandestine operation, even after they killed the president and Martin Luther King and all these other people. Bobby Kennedy, they were still had a lot of cover. And so one of our goals as the White Panther Party was to uncover the CIA and their presence in our midst and their influence on things and what they meant really in terms of world domination by the United States. Consequently, these guys, somebody, blew up, put, put a couple of sticks of dynamite and front of the door of this office. When they went off, police and the news reporters would have to find out what was behind that door. And this really caused quite a great furor, for which we were very happy. <laughs> and then we took the Abbott Hoffman influenced defense maneuver of charging the CIA with the crime. Became, we called our trial the CIA conspiracy trial. The CIA is a conspiracy against the people of America. We got Bill Kunstler and Leonard Weinglass to represent us right after the Chicago 7 trial. And we filed a flurry of motions in the court, federal court, before Judge Damon Keith. We drew the judge who was like the dream judge for us, a black left-wing activist judge, now a federal judge, appointed by John F. Kennedy. And so we've advanced these motions before him. One was for, is there any evidence obtained or have any of the defendants been wiretapped. And another was they just passed the 18-year-old vote. And of course part of the White Panther Party concept was that youth was a class, another idiotic uh, mental construct I came up with. <laughs> Of course they aren't a class, they're just you, they're passing through. But we thought, we thought, we were on acid, you know. We kind of foreshadowed that horrible reactionary philosophy they developed in the 80s about history is over, you know. We've blasted through history, you know. It's always going to be like this now. Well, not the case. <laughs> Sad to say. <laughs> 
That one we brought Allen Ginsberg and Julian Bond to testify that youth was indeed different. <laughs> and we won that one. So. In the state of Mississippi, many years ago, a boy of 14 years got a taste of Southern law. He saw his friend a hanging, his color was his crime, and the blood upon his jacket put a brand upon his mind. But in the end, we won a ruling on our motion about the wiretaps. And the prosecution came forward, that is to say the Nixon Justice Department came forward and said, yes, we have information on one of the defendants that was obtained by wiretap. It doesn't have anything to do with the case. And we can't tell you who the wiretap was on because it's a matter of national security. So what do you mean? They say, well, you know, when Bill Rehnquist was in the Justice Department, he helped us draft this policy called the National Security Wiretap, for which you wouldn't need a warrant. If the president says this is a matter of national security, he could tap you without a warrant. Nixon, man, what a character. The committee to reelect the president, creep. <laughs> That was about as good as it got in the Nixon era, with John Ed Mitchell, head creep, you know. Boy, were they a rough bunch, man. You think you're up against some guys now, these guys, well, they're rougher now because they know how to do it. But these guys were inventing it, you know what I'm saying? They were like, Nixon. <laughs> that goddamn Nixon, as we always called him. <laughs> So Judge Keith, being the sort of individual that he was, ruled that the government had to disclose the swear tab, and in fact ruled that there was no such thing permitted under the U.S. Constitution as a warrantless swear tab. That's why you had the Fourth Amendment. And the uh, government ended up appealing this all the way to the Supreme Court. The government appealed it. Anyway, we won eight to nothing in the Supreme Court. And they say, and I hesitate even to report this because it seems like such a case of self-aggrandizement, but they say our case was decided on a Friday afternoon, but they didn't release it to the press until Monday morning. And they say that during this weekend, Justice Rehnquist uh, may well have called his comrades in the Justice Department and warned them that this ruling was going to be issued Monday morning and that if they had any national security wiretaps in place, now would be the time to get them out so that on Monday they could say that they had none. And that Saturday night was when they were in the Watergate Hotel removing the wiretaps from the National Democratic National Committee office. in Jackson Prison in the, what they called the Triple O Ward. The, no, you were locked up 23 hours a day. No interaction with the main population. I never entered the main population at Jackson, the world's largest walled prison. <laughs> they kept you inside the whole time? Yeah, every minute. Yeah. And then when we started the federal litigation, this was the worst part of the whole sentence. They would, and you would understand this as an ex-convict, they would send me back to the Wayne County Jail so I could meet with my lawyers and be there for the hearings in the federal court. And so I'd have to pack up my prison possessions and be taken in chains back to the Detroit County Jail, Wayne County Jail, like hell itself. And then I would spend two months at a time in there. 
Yeah, oh, Jesus, I hate to even think about that. It's just such a depressing thing. We're, we're waiting here for you to get out. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I'm waiting to come out, you know. They passed that bill yesterday, and I think that, uh, that it's going to happen, you know. It's going to happen. It, it's got to. <laughs> People are just too deep into it. <laughs> I'm too excited. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm shaking. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I just want to come home. Oh, that was rough, man. <laughs> Because, you know, the county jail is purposely run as a brutal institution as part of the pressure on the convict to cop to a felony charge. And then they can be free to go to the state penitentiary where they can have half of a life, you know. <laughs> no life in the county jail. Anyway, I, when I think of that period, that's the overwhelming part to me was going back to that motherfucker, man. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> anyway, it's coming to the end of 1971. All the time I've been incarcerated, I've been actively involved with, with my group of people, which were the White Panther Party. And then in 1971, we transmogrified ourselves into the Rainbow People's Party. We thought that we had pretty much done everything we could to alienate ourselves from our potential mass base by taking up this violent imagery of the Panthers. And we thought, this isn't really advancing our cause too well. And we had three of our main guys in prison. One of them had been on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. So we became the Rainbow People's Party. We advanced the idea of rainbow, of everyone getting along together. Real hippie thing. Because the hippie movement had become a mass movement by then. College students were hippies. When I went to prison in 69, college students were squares. They were frat boys and football players and drinkers. And, Square, short hairs, you know. <laughs> and when I came out two and a half years later, they were all hippies. Which was kind of mind boggling. But my people have been trying to tell me this, you know. Of course, I'm in a prison with a bunch of criminals. <laughs> Not a hippie in sight, you know. Because <laughs> they weren't sending hippies to prison then, yet. Pretty much. You pretty much had to have committed a crime. I, that's why I was, I stood out for my sentence because it was obvious that they had nailed me on some technicality for a bigger crime with which they couldn't charge me. <laughs> Sedition or treason or whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm uh, very proud of this because I was very intimately involved, not only with my own defense, but also as the chairman of our party. And I, you look in my archives at the University of Michigan Bentley Historical Library, you'll find reams of letters. I wrote seven single-space typewritten pages home every night for two and a half years. <laughs> You know, the thing I hate about this whole thing is it comes down in history that I was this terrible victim. <laughs> but I wasn't really a victim. I just looked at this as part of my, part of my job. If you're going to be a revolutionary, you were going to have to go to prison. Lenin went to prison. Ho Chi Minh was in prison. All the great people went to prison. Charlie Parker went to prison. Gene Ammons did seven years for heroin. You know, I mean, Dexter Gordon was in, yeah, Letty Bruce did time. I mean, it was just part of your job. And I had a beautiful support system, and my wife, Lenny, and my brother, David, were key members of the organization, so. 
So I was buoyed and held up by these people that I worked with, you know, who worked ceaselessly to get me out, ceaselessly. And part of it being rock and rollers, of course the MC5 had defected just before I went to prison and they decided they didn't want to do this anymore. Certainly their prerogative. Take out the chance, motherfucker! <laughs> So every week, virtually, for two and a half years, there was some kind of rock and roll benefit in my behalf, whether it drew a hundred people or a thousand people. And all the little money that came, they would give it to us and we'd give it to the lawyers. Or use it for survival of the, of the group. Oh, dear John Sinclair, we celebrate your liberty. We organized the biggest event we had ever done. And a friend of ours was now working for the University of Michigan as the head of their office of major events, trying to teach them how to put on rock and roll shows and make money with them. Whereas when I was out there, we used to have to sue the University of Michigan every time we wanted to put the MC5 in one of their facilities. Well, now they realize that it was big business, going to be big business. So they hired Peter M. Andrews to show them how to do it. Well, because of this, he had access to the university uh, facilities. And through some miracle, he arranged, we formed a student organization and we run out the basketball arena, 14,400 seat, Chrysler Arena, to put on a show to free John Sinclair on December 10th, 1971. In the course of organizing, trying to attract people that would draw a huge crowd, because we had to get a huge crowd to show that, you know, it was a political thing. You had to show that you were winning in order to win. <laughs> and in the course of it, we had a miracle happen. Our friend Jerry Rubin had become close with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And he suggested to them that he was going to Ann Arbor to play. He told them about my case. And he said he was coming to Ann Arbor to play on my behalf. And maybe they'd like to come too. And they said maybe we would. And they did. We came here not only to help John and to spotlight what's going on, but also to show and to say to all of you that uh, apathy isn't it, and that we can do something. This song I wrote for John Sinclair. One, two, one, two, three, four. It ain't fair, John Sinclair, in the step of breathing hell. Won't you care for John Sinclair, in the step of breathing hell? Let him be, set him free, let him be like you and me. I gave him ten for two, what else can Judge Columba do? We got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. If he was a soldier man Shooting gooks in Vietnam If he was the CIA Selling dope and making hay He'd be free, they'd let him be Breathing air like you and me They gave him ten for two What else can Judge Columbus To jail for what he done Or representing everyone Free John now if he can From the clutches of a man Let him be, lift the lid Bring him to his wife and kids All right They gave him ten for two What else can the bastards do? 
on my side. <laughs> it was a most beautiful and rapid, swift transformation. And after that, the things, did, you know, he came and he wrote a song for me. He came and played it to headline this big show. And three days later, they let me out on the peel bond, which was a very mythological situation. Yeah. I mean, apart from the personal effect on me, the happiest moment of my life, <laughs> by far, uh, and I've had a lot of happiness, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But also, uh, yeah, we thought this was a brilliant victory on our part and that our rhetoric had been justified and endorsed by the, uh, by the results. We said you could take rock and roll and use it to change the world and do good things and all of a sudden John Lennon gets me out of prison. You know? <laughs> so we worked off of that for the next couple of years trying to organize hippies into a political force. So I like trying to herd cats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it everything I had and I concluded in the end that it was impossible. And by that time in 75 or so when I kind of gave up on this, uh, the war was over, Nixon had been thrown out of office, the first oil crisis had occurred and they raised all the prices on everything. They doubled the cost of life in America overnight. And this incidentally started this whole thing that they've got two wars going on now for, the oil thing. So by the end of 75, you know, the hippies, it was over for hippiness. You had to get a job. And of course, you get a job, you had to cut your hair, and then so they had the drug tests, and they had the whole thing. So the hippie movement kind of ran a fall on the grounds of economic determinism, you know. It's a beautiful period, though. I pray that it comes back before I croak. <laughs> I pray for the young people every year that they take some acid and discover that you can change this shit. That you don't have to just eat it, you know. Not much evidence so far, though. <laughs> so I just quit at that time. And then I, in general, and this was the end of the process that had taken a couple of years. And then I just realized that these people didn't want to have the kind of world that I had fought so valiantly and so long and made so many sacrifices in my personal life because I thought that it would be a beautiful thing if we could all have this world. And I realized that that wasn't the world they wanted. They wanted to have a job. They wanted to have a car. They wanted to live in the suburbs and bring their kids up and then go to all white schools, you know, and the whole thing. I said, well, they can do that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so I just reconnected with the kind of beatnik poetry life I had, beatnik poetry and jazz life I had before I got involved in the struggle, so to speak, the, the political struggle. It was always a struggle. <laughs> I regard myself as an example of what Ho Chi Minh said when he commented that men who come out of prison can build up the country. <laughs> if I had to do it again, fight the law, not snitch on anybody, not plead guilty, I'd do it again. I mean, I think I would. I don't know. I'm old now. I gave up a lot more then than I would now, you know. <laughs> I had a child and a child on the way, so now my kids are 40 and 43. 
So I could do it now. I could go do some time. Because, oh, you know, I mean, I read and I make radio shows. If I had a computer, I could do time easy. I do time. I live like in a cell wherever I am. You know, I have a little room where I'm lucky I have my own room. And it's like my cell. And I got my old books and my records. And I got everything on my hard drive. I don't require much. So. I'm still having a great time. Hello? John, okay, here's John. You're on tape now. Yeah. Hello? 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 <laughs> Hello, John? Yeah! Great! <laughs> so there you are, right? Right. Here we are. Really? Great. Yes, yes. So yes. what happened? I don't know, man. They just so told me to go. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That thing, you know, I did it, man. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan, man, they granted a bond on their own motion. Beautiful. They made it up themselves. Right. Very clever of them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, isn't it? How's Yoko? Oh, she's fine. Yeah. She's used to it. Oh, great. Very, very good. Hello, John. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good. Well, look, we're so glad, and it really gave us hope and everything. Hi, you. I mean, you know, it became like history, right? Oh, really? I heard you, I heard you on the radio. Well, because he gave us uh, all his incentive, you see. The people in New York and all that were very down mood. You yeah. Know, he came here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we felt like this large generation is over and uh, right. nothing's going to happen, right? Right. But we can start all over again, right? It's beautiful. It yeah. was a victory, man, just like that. Yeah, I mean, it's never <laughs> too late to start, you see. Right. <laughs>